So now, welcome everyone to the second episode of the Not So Late Night Dart Show, our first episode of the year 2021 after having left the dreaded year 2020 behind us. Let's hope that this one is going to be much better than the last one. And uh, for the first episode after the World Darts Championship, we've got none other here than our newly crowned World Darts Champion, Gerwin Price. Gezi, thank you very much for joining us. No worries, well. And uh, of course, our, our second second guest of the night, the asset, Paul Nicholson, former Players Championship Finals champion. Paul, good to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Philip. It's really nice to talk to you guys. And obviously, a very warm welcome to all of you watching us at home. This is uh, supposed to be a bit of an interactive show, of course. The ones, uh, the ones of you that have been here the last time know that. That uh, if you raise your hand, there's this, this little function that you can find at the bottom of the of the screen here where you can raise your hand and um, at certain points in the discussion we're going to let you join us here one or two of you that can ask our professionals a couple of questions and uh, we can have a, a, a lovely chat ho uh, hopefully over one hour until uh, until 8 p.m german time so go and as i said it's been a, a good week now since uh, the world Dust championship ended um, has it sunk in yet new new world champion and new world number one I think it's starting to sink in, but I don't know. I've um, kept myself busy doing different projects this week and just trying to keep my mind occupied. But yeah, sinking in a little bit. I mean, I've been speaking to, to Bethan earlier, obviously your, your manager and your wife, and she said, it's been absolutely crazy. that She, she answers two, two emails and there's five or ten new ones. <laughs> so uh, that's a new experience for you as well. Yeah, yeah well, I'm, I'm glad that she's there to take take all that pressure off me really because obviously like she said she's had emails left right and center people requesting interviews and, and zooms and everything and yeah fair play to her she's been quite hectic the last uh, seven days these the, all these annoying people that ask you to do zoom calls I can't, yeah, I so. who, who's that <laughs> who, who, who might that be but it's, it's very friendly <laughs> that you turn the bbc and abc down only to be here with us tonight for the not so late night art show so paul obviously you've been covering the world championships as well um as, as a commentator i reckon and obviously for the media side of it um it's, it's been a bit of a different one this year obviously i mean have, have you been to early Pelly this year or do, do, were you doing it from a distance we were at Alexandra Palace this year. We normally have, with uh, TalkSport Network, the best seat in the house because we're stage left and we can see all of the action on the stage and we can get the heat from the arena. We can hear everything that's going on as well as having the earphones on and having the interaction between the different commentators. But it was very different. It, you know, When we were put out in the back area where the fans are supposed to be in the cold Grand Hall and our view was not of the stage, it was of the bins, it was a little bit different, but the action itself was a, was a nice detachment for us. It didn't matter where we were, we would had our eyes fixed on the screens and we were watching some incredible matches. And I think one of my lasting memories of that championship is just how many matches went really, really close. And it turns out it was 16 matches that went to the last leg and I don't think we'll ever see that again. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. I mean, I, I was there as well. I don't know. I think you guys were in the red zone. I was one of the sorry people of the of, of the ember zone. So that's why we didn't see each other there. Um, but certainly, the feeling walk just walking into Alexandra Palace. I mean, normally that's such a such a a bright and happy place where everyone's having a good time. Then you walk in there and you've got all the all the seats, all the chairs outside of the of, of the West Hall. And that, a bit impressive. What was it like for you, uh, going playing playing on stage? <coughs> Obviously, playing it was just like another event. Um, just felt like uh, like the Grand Slam. It was just like the 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 match play and, and the Players Championship. All the events just just feel exactly the same. Now, obviously, with with different pressures, but yeah, the the atmosphere, the, the surroundings, the build up, and everything's just the same. And yeah, definitely not not the same without the crowd or or the atmosphere. But you know, what can we do without that? Yeah, it was cer certainly a, a hectic event, certainly the first couple of days when it, when it was, you know, a thousand fans and then no fans. And then all of a sudden, you know, the virus going completely crazy and we're all, all leaving the place. I mean, well, let's, let's, let's all be happy that we've got this one under, under our belts there. Um, I mean, Paul, you mentioned it. So many, many close or very close games in that World Championship. And also, Gerwin, you were involved in quite a, quite a few of them, actually. I mean, uh, Three of your first four matches went to the last set. Two of them went to the last leg. So, especially at the beginning of the of, of the event, I thought 
you were actually my favourite to win it. It's easy to say now, but I, I said the <laughs> championship, you're, you're probably going to win it. But at, at the start, it, it, it was a bit, uh, yeah, it was not that easy for you. Yeah, but I, I spoke to my buddy John after the Jamie Lewis game and you know, I never played my best darts, but, but I come through and the first game is always the toughest one. And then I came home for Christmas, chilled out, decided to go back up on my own. I'm a little bit superstitious and I played rubbish, obviously, in my first game. So I said to John, he's going to stay home, do some work in, in the house that I'm doing out. I'm, I'm going back up on my own. But I said to him as well, I said, you know, you, you don't win the tournament first, second, third round. You don't want to be blowing gaskets early on and then coming up dry at the end. And I said to him, I said, I just hope I peak at the right time, you know, quarters, semis and final. No, I didn't play really good in my quarters, but I think I, I kept my best for the, for the semi and most certainly the final anyway. But like Michael and everybody flew out the blocks first three games that they were flying, 107, 108, 106 average. I was like, I need to up my game a little bit. Yeah, but yeah, they seem to have um, peaked a little bit too soon. And then, yeah, you know, Joe Cullen give Michael a fantastic game. You know, but I, I, when I got to the final, I was looking back at Gary's games and he never, never had it, not really got pushed at all either. So I thought maybe he had kept his best game until last, but thankfully he didn't. Yeah, that, that is that is for sure. That was certainly certainly a good development for you as as the, as the tournament progressed. There, I mean, Paul, this year might have been the the first year in in, in ages that that Michael Van Gerwen did not go into the tournament as everyone's favorite. At the years before, everyone was like, "Well, who's going to win it, Michael?" Michael. Obviously, there were three or four other players that could have won it, but maybe this year was the first time where a lot of people said, "Actually, Gerwen Prize is the favorite here." So that must have been different for for Gezi as well going into the tournament with that favorite role, sort of. So. Yeah, I think that's true to a certain extent. But I think uh, Gerwin was, over the course of 2020, warming to the task of potentially becoming world number one and potentially world champion. Having that favourite tag is something that he's had a lot in events where you know Michael's already been eliminated. Uh, so winning an event like World Grand Prix, I think, was incredibly telling because he'd already said that double start wasn't his forte. But if you go on and win an event that's not your forte... What can you do when you're playing an event that you genuinely enjoy? So I'm not surprised by the result, but I was surprised that a lot of people didn't hype up for Gerwin and others potentially as much. But because Michael won the Players' Championship Finals, I think myself included, I, I did pitch for Michael, but I had Gezi getting to the final and then potentially having a real dust-up like they've done with, with other majors like the UK Open and the Players' Championship Finals, but I think it's, it's good for the sport. I think we need something that tennis has had, like they've had with Nadal, Federer, Djokovic and Murray, and then some others who are capable of winning slams. Now we have that cluster, but with the world number one, we have a new target on Gezi's back, of course, and it's up to the rest to take that off him. It's funny that you should mention they're taking the word number one back off back off Gerwin because uh, we've prepared a couple of polls for for the for the fans here watching us. Um, so a couple of polls where we want to ask for their opinion. And the first poll we've got for tonight actually is this one. It's the MVG one, and it says, "Will Michael Van Gerwen reclaim the number one spot in the near future?" And I am very interested in what. Uh, our viewers have to say to that so let's give them a couple of uh, a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes to actually to actually talk about that so Paul what I mean obviously a lot of that has been discussed many many times now Michael and Michael's job of form this year you obviously you're, you're quite close to the players as well and you can analyze it how did you analyze it? where where did you see his problems this year what was it only down to the new dance or was it more than that Oh, it wasn't the darts. I mean, all you got to do is look at the UK Open. He, he won the UK Open with the new darts, so it wasn't that. I think when things got a little bit tricky in the summer-autumn time when he wasn't winning as many events as he usually would, I think he needed a bit of a comfort blanket in the old setup. So that's why he went back to that. But the darts wasn't the problem. Every career is not going to be a constant rise or a constant plateau. You're going to have down periods. And you're going to need to come out of these down periods. It's inevitable. He has come out of that down period and played exceptionally well. But ultimately, some of the greatest players in any sport who attain the world number one spot and win multiple world championships or whatever it is in their sport, 
they will have to react to bad times. And it's how they react to that. That's how they are defined. Phil Taylor has done it. He wasn't always world number one. He lost it to the likes of Rod Harrington, to uh, Colin Lloyd, to Peter Manley. He came out of it. But I think we talk a lot about legacies and the likes of Gezi and, of course, Michael Van Gogh and their legacies won't be written for ages. But it's about what they're doing now, which is particularly interesting. And with Michael and his... Uh, they've called it a backlash, which is something that came out in the spring. And a lot of the haters on social media have been saying, well, where's this backlash you've been talking about? Well, it's not that easy because eight years ago when Michael Van Gerwen was coming through and winning his first major at the World Grand Prix, Gerwen Price was not even on tour. So we didn't know of the threat. Now we have Price, we have Wright, we have all of the other crop of players as well coming through winning majors like De Souza and Vandenberg. So he's got more people gunning for him and they're all gunning for Gezi now. <laughs> Well, happy day, happy days for you, Gezi. I mean, that was that was the the impression that I got at the World Championships. I mean, as as Paul mentioned, Michael winning the Players Championship finals and then kicking off the world the way he did in, in great fashion. Everyone thought, oh, now he's back to his best. When he went out in the quarterfinal against Chizzy, where Chizzy was playing absolutely out of this world, I had the feeling that. Now all the, all the players, and they started thinking differently about the words. It was like, oh, he's gone, and now it's basically everyone's to win. Was that the feeling that you got as well? <coughs> no, I mean, I was on the, on the other after Michael as well. Sort of when Peter went out, I thought possibly I could meet Peter in the semi-final, but I never really looked. You look, you look at the path, obviously, to the final, but you have to get in. And, you know, Michael was on the other after me, but... Him going out and Peter going out, obviously, yeah, it gives you a little bit of a boost, but I really wanted to play Michael in that final. Now, I've got, got good news for you, Gerwin, because um, when everything turns out, if everything turns out the way that our viewers here predicted, then that means that uh, you will retain that word number one spot for quite some time, because it's 71% that say that Michael Van Gerwen is not going to reclaim the word number one spot in the near future. So... Uh, Congratulations, Gezi. Well, well done for that one. So, yeah, but, but that doesn't mean that Peter or anybody else can't get their mind. That's true. That's true. That's almost, <laughs> the question was too, too tight, basically. Yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> but, but obviously, with you winning the Worlds and on the same night, you know, claiming the world number one spot, that is basically two massive, massive goals and massive dreams coming true on the this, on this same night. Is, is there a, a danger of... of a sort of a, you know a development where you feel like where you find it hard to to find the motivation for for the ne next tournament. Um, to be honest, after after the final and the interviews the morning after, that was sort of my my, my mindset, and I'd be like, oh, I've won the worlds, I've become the world number one. I, I'm happy. I don't care if I don't win another tournament. But then a week down the line, I think it's just made me reevaluate and think, yeah, I, I want to win this tournament again. I want to. I want to get past Michael. I want to win more worlds than Michael. I want to win more worlds than, than Raymond Van Barneveld. I'm never going to win more worlds than, than Phil Taylor. You know, it's just not, it's not going to happen. But there's other targets out there. I want to get past Michael. I want to get past Raymond. I want to win the Premier League. You know, I want to win the Grand Slam again. And yeah, I want to win tournaments that, that I am won. But yeah, it would be nice to defend this trophy and have it back to back and get past Michael and say, oh, I've got four, you've got three. And, no, it's just those sort of more things are motivating. Well, that's probably a, a great approach, actually, to you know set new goals, find new targets uh, to go for. As we set our sights on our first uh, couple of viewer questions, we've got a couple of hands up here, and we've got uh, we've got Anke. Anke, that sounds that sounds female and that sounds German. So we're going to get Anke into the discussion for her to ask a question. I'm going to give her a couple of seconds. If she, there she is. So now we only have to hear her. Hopefully. Anke, du musst noch uh, dein, uh, die Stummschaltung. Das müssen wir noch aufheben. Or if, if you, yeah, there we go. Hello. Hi there. So, hi there. I'm very proud to be here. Hi, Gerbin. Hello, how are you? Hello. 
Oh, Gavin, congratulations. We are so happy that you have won this match. We are fans from you and our son Nico has the flight of you from the Iceman. And um, so congratulations from Germany. Thank you very much. So, so, so the question was just a, a big congratulations there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel? Um, so you have won the first match and so they said that you can play with the rugby players together a match. You know well, what I mean? In darts or in rugby? In rugby. So they said um, if you win this match, um, you are the rugby player and so you can together play the rugby match. I don't understand. Um, Neither do I. Anke, vielleicht kannst du es mir auf Deutsch sagen und dann versuchen versuch wir es auf Englisch. Sie haben gesagt, wenn er gewinnt, kann er, weil er ja ähm, jetzt, ähm, wie heißt es, ähm, ähm, ich bin ein bisschen nervös gerade, Entschuldigung. Alles ähm, gut, wir sind, wir sind alle nervös. <lacht> <lacht> ähm, dass, ähm, er war ja äh, Rugby-Player. Und no. sie haben gesagt, dass er dann mit der Mannschaft zusammen mal ein Rugby-Match spielen kann. Mit welcher Mannschaft? Mit seiner ehemaligen? oder? Genau, von Wales. Ah, ah okay, ah, mit der walisischen Nationalmannschaft. Richtig, genau, haben sie doch gesagt, ja, dass er mal zusammen, wenn er gewinnt, ja, zusammen ein Rugby-Match machen kann. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So the, so the question is, Gezi, now that you won the, the World Dice Championship, there's a, apparently there was some rumor going around that if you win that, that, that you can play uh, a game with the Welsh Rugby National Team or something. Is there something? Well, that's the first I've heard, but yeah, I'd, I'd happily take up the one opportunity and have maybe one game from, as long as it's against England. <laughs> 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 there we go. So, Anke, does, does that, that answer satisfy you there? Yes, thank you very much. Perfect, no worries. Anke, thank you so much for joining us and uh, have a lovely evening. Thanks for, for asking the question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, now we put Anke back to the viewers. Can I, could, can I quickly just pop to my toilet there in two seconds? <laughs> yeah, no worries, no worries. Have, have a go. <laughs> That's really live, this. It's really live. So, Let's say while Gerwin is gone, maybe there's a question for Paul as well. And we've got a couple of hands up. There's got to be someone who wants to ask Paul a question. And we've got, uh, we're picking out Sebastian. Sebastian, we're going for Sebastian. And let's wait and see and hear. Now, Sebastian, you need to unmute yourself as well so we can hear you. Ah, there we go. Sebastian, you can hear us? I can hear you. You can hear me? Perfect, perfect. Sebastian, where, where are you watching this from? Where are you from? Uh, near Coburg in Bavaria. Oh, hello. That's, Hi. that's <laughs> nice. Hello from Bavaria to Bavaria. So you got a question to Paul Nicholson? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, maybe two little questions. Um, first question is, Paul, do you plan to attend Q School uh, this year or later? So planning to come back as a professional maybe and the um, second question would be do you follow the the Australian scene still and do you think there are players like Damon Hita going over to England and try to come uh, to become a professional? Well I'll, I'll come back to the the first question uh, after the Australian one because yes I still follow the Dark Players Australia circuit I think it's really important to see more talent coming from that part of the world obviously with the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of the talent down there uh, haven't been able to travel interstate, so from, say, Queensland to Western Australia and all over the country to try and get ranking points uh, to come to Alexandra Palace and you know, have cracks at Q School. It's, it's just not been conducive through 2020. There is more to find talent-wise down there. Such a, a huge expat community from the UK They've taken darts to Australia and there are more talents to find. So I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, Damon Hetter is going to stay in England. He's uh, based himself in Derbyshire. He's going to be around for a while. He's a fantastic player. And I, I really do think that he's going to be worrying people at the thick end of tournaments throughout the course of 2021 and 2022. But as for others, they will come over because they've seen the likes of Kyle Anderson, um, myself, Simon Whitlock, and Damon, of course, succeed. But it does take a big sacrifice to do that. And it's financial, 
it's emotional and if you are able to make that sacrifice there's no telling what you can do with your future but as far as myself in q school i've been asked this question an awful lot and i haven't answered it publicly <laughs> uh for a very specific reason is because i haven't made my mind up in relation to 2021 the deadline is coming i am practicing and all i wanted to do going into this potential q school was to be able to throw without any pain and that seems to be happening right now. But when the deadline comes, I will make my mind up. But I haven't made my mind up yet. Oh, here we go. I thought we were going to have a, a massive, massive breaking news here. Paul Nicholson <laughs> announcing on a not so late night art show that he's going to attend Q School. Uh, he teased us there. He teased us. Oh, Sebastian, uh, I think two great answers. Thank you so much uh, for your yes. questions and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. So that is Sebastian back to the viewers. Perfect. So now let's move on. Moving on from the World Arts Championship to, uh, as far as the topic goes, obviously it means one thing. We've got the Premier League coming up and shortly after the uh, World Arts Championship, obviously the uh, participants of the, World Art, of the Premier League 2021 have been announced and uh, we've got them right here. So... Um, I mean, asking the two of you, Paul and, and, and Gerwin, um, so nine players from 10 have been announced already. A um, couple of surprises for you. Do you agree with, uh, with the lineup or how, how do you see that? Me or? Both of you, really. Gezi, if you want to go first. Yeah, I think um, all those should, should definitely be in. Um, I, for me, the, the top 10 when I looked at it was probably the top 10 pick. But um, obviously, you've got D'Souza, who has won a major, and um, Dimitri's in the top 10 anyway. Glenn's the defending champion. Rob Cross, you know, has probably got into the skin of his teeth of staying in that top four. But um, I, I think uh, all those deserve it. I have to agree. I, I, I compiled my list at Alexandra Palace when working with Chris Mason, and we, we spent a good two, two and a half hours talking about this list. And we were all making lists on the provision that Rob Cross was still in the top four. If he was going to fifth, because Gary Anderson, if he won the title, would go to, fifth, to fourth. If he won that tournament, I think Cross would not be in this list because the form in 2020 wasn't there. And there wasn't really an excuse to put him in. As a consequence of Rob being fourth, he's there. He's now got the spot. He's got to make the most of it. As far as everybody else is concerned, there is no way this wouldn't be the lineup. They've got it absolutely spot on. We know that the world number six, Dave Chisnell, is not in the lineup, but there is one spot left. And that is what makes the Masters really intriguing now. Because when you look at an unranked event that typically is a curtain raiser to the, to the uh, eventual year, it doesn't really get the juices flowing a great deal. People just think of it as a curtain raiser. But now it has a bit of extra credibility because whoever does have that big run. If it is someone like Dave Chisnell, James Wade, Davo Gurney, for instance, someone from that particular bracket can now book their place via an unranked event. It's, it's going to be a huge event. I, I really do that, think that someone's going to come out of the pack for it. Now, obviously, having the 10th player still, uh, still not picked yet, that uh, calls for a poll, I'd say. And this is why we ask our viewers here, who would you like to see in the 2021 Premier League? We've got uh, 10 options there for you. So we're going to give you a bit of time. Um, and to do that, we're going to ask Gerwin, what do you think? Who should go in? Who will go in? Who would you like to see in? Who would you not like to see in, maybe? Well, if you're based on rankings and the way people have played, the lot of the special last couple of months, like Paul mentioned there, Chizzy probably deserves to be in. Rather, um, I think he's possibly the only one out of out of um, out of the top sixteen. Who's I know Joe Cullen's been playing well, but he's not really won anything major. But yeah, I think Chizzy at this moment in time probably deserves it over everyone. But maybe they, they're leaving that space open, maybe. But if someone new wins the Masters or someone, I don't know if they're going to do the UK Open before the Premier League starts, but possibly a cheesy for me, but maybe someone who comes through the Masters and wins who hasn't won anything so far. Well, possible. I think uh, that uh, our results here have sort of 
settled down. Most, most viewers have uh, given us their opinion here. So let's have a look at that. It's actually 30% oh. of the viewers say that Chizzy should go into the Premier League and uh, he's followed by, well, is that maybe a bit of German bias, Gabriel? <laughs> and possibly, but uh, maybe that is, that is just as objective as it goes. And uh, who knows, who knows? I mean, as you said, if he has a great run at the Masters and, uh, you know, it might as well. Happen. We've got a lot of, you know, 12%, 11%, 12% for Dirk van Dijvenbode. Obviously, he, he might be uh, one to look at if he has another great run at the at the Masters like he had at the World Grand Prix or the Worlds. So we'll see. Uh, certainly a very, very interesting question that uh, that needs needs answering in the next uh, next couple, couple of days or next couple of weeks. So, guys, I've been thinking, as uh, this show obviously um, credits itself with not only talking about darts, but also talking about, about other things, um, I thought about, you know, how can we sort of link those two together tonight? And as we now have our first, uh, first ever Welsh PDC World Darts Champion and Welsh World Number One, it is about that time that we learn a couple of things about whales, I think. So we, we found two rather interesting questions here that, that we, we need, uh, need an answer to. And um, while um, obviously Paul and Gezi are going to answer them, the uh, viewers here are going to answer them as well. So let me quickly share my screen here. And then we can see question number one, which is the village that holds the record for the longest place name in Europe is located in Wales. How many letters does the village's name have? So give me a second to start our next poll here. Uh, I've got to look at my second screen and then we go for the next one, which is that one. And here we go. So is it either 46 letters, 50 letters, 55 or 58 letters? So now, Paul, so do I, do, I have, do I have to press on it? No, you, you can't press on it because you, you are part of the discussion. You just, you just have to give your, your answer uh, orally, let's say, let's say. Um, I'm thinking D, 58. D, 58. Paul, you go for? Well, I'm going to go for the bullseye. I'm going to go for 50. I know that it ends with a few Gs. I think it's og 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 something like that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go for 50, being, being a I'm dog. I'm try. <laughs> so now let's have a look what our viewers said. Our viewers go for 55. 55% say 55. If that's not a sign, I don't know what is. But the correct answer actually is 58. So go in. <laughs> <laughs> go in knows his home country very well. And uh, so oh, let's a guess. <laughs> <laughs> so let's have a quick look here at uh, obviously we have to take a look at uh, at that word now there here we go isn't it beautiful and it actually translates to saint mary's church in a hollow of white hazel near the rapid whirlpool of the church of saint Tisilio with a red cave if that is if that isn't catchy i don't know what is <laughs> jesus look at the law how can you say that and i'm even welsh well, so, so I was going to ask if you can pronounce that. No, I'm not even trying that. <laughs> <laughs> no, good, good for us though. Good for us that there is someone that knows how pro how to pronounce this, and uh, it is actually the weatherman of Channel Four. So let's let's have a let's have a listen to that and. Uh, and just stand there in awe. Now today we had a big contrast in temperature across the UK, just 12 degrees over coastal parts of eastern England with cloudy skies, but in the sunshine in northwest Wales at RAF Mona, just up the road from Clanbyre to Pushkwingish, Gogeda Quindrobos, Lantisilio Gogogoch, the temperature got to 21 Celsius at 70 in Fahrenheit. So, Gezi, why can you not pronounce that? It's absolutely straightforward. Give it a go, go on. <laughs> How though? <laughs> look at it. Look, look at the part where it said four L's in a row. Yeah, I just know it says go 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 on the end. Yeah, that's. that's I figured that out as well. But <laughs> that's where it ends. You can guarantee that that weatherman, when he hit the hit the note right there, he's gone off camera and given it the full price. Go on after that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely nailed it. Absolutely. If, if he hasn't, if that guy didn't get a raise after that. He should, he should have gotten one, most, most certainly. So now, we got 
we got a second question, obviously, because if it is one question, it's not a quiz. We need a second question to make it a quiz. And this is the second question relative to its size. Wales is a European country with the most pubs, rugby pitches, castles, or sheep. So <laughs> we're gonna go, we're gonna start the poll for our viewers again. Give me a second. So that gives Paul and Gezi a bit of time to have a think about this. So now here we go. So now Paul, Gezi, what, what do you think? What, what could it be? I'm gonna say castles. Yeah, I was I was leaning towards castles as well. And I, I know there's a lot of sheep there and <laughs> there's definitely ruby pitches, but I just get the feeling that there's a there's a lot of small castles in Wales. So I'm, I'm gonna go with Gezi. I'm gonna go with castles. Okay, so our pros go with castles. Well, well let's wait another couple of seconds here until the final people have decided. hundred and yeah, that's 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 good. That's good, that's good. So let's let's end this and show the results. So our viewers go for castles as well, and I can assure you, castles is the correct answer. Well, actually, it's well possible that all four of them are correct, but I only found evidence for for castles. So, uh, <laughs> so, so not quite sure. It's funny that you should mention should have mentioned the the sheep because we looked something up. There's actually a statistic that uh, per person, or, or per per, uh, per Welsh person, there are four sheep. In, in Wales, and what do you think is the percentage of, of in Australia higher or lower? More sheep per person in Australia or lower? Ooh, that's tough. I've actually been to a few sheep farms in Northern Victoria, and there's a lot of them. Uh, I, I'm going to say there's there's probably five sheep to every person in Australia. Well, yeah, it's, it's it's more than four. That's great. It's eight sheep wow. per person in Australia. That is that is an, an incredible number, actually. There. And I was, I was, you know, coming back to the uh, 58 lesser place name, I was quite disappointed. I was, I was hurt in my German pride because I thought we were the country that is known for long words uh, that, you cannot, <laughs> that you cannot pronounce properly. Turns out that uh, the longest place name in Germany is only 27 letters. We're, we're being beat by a country mile there by Wales. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's ridiculous. I've, I've written it down, but I can't read my own handwriting, so I won't, I won't, I won't read it out. <laughs> So now, so now, that was our little uh, excursion to, to Wales, the, the home country of our new world champion. Another little, uh, uh, another little detour that, that we're gonna that we're gonna make is we're gonna talk about another sport, a sport that I know is very very uh, near and dear to Paul Nicholson's heart. That is, and, and we're actually in the decisive uh, phase of this of the season. There's NFL, American football. Uh, Paul, this is a massive passion of you. Well, people that follow you on your Twitter or your Instagram will know there's been Pittsburgh Steelers all over the place there. Yeah, I, I've followed them for a very long time and I'm feeling a bit somber uh, this evening because we were eliminated from the NFL playoffs by the Cleveland Browns a couple of nights ago. It's one of the reasons why I'm feeling pretty tired today, actually, because I stayed up till four o'clock in the morning to watch it. But yeah, it, it was an unexpected defeat. We we caused our own, own downfall, but... Steelers uh, won the Super Bowl in the year that I was born. And that was one of the reasons why I supported them um, as a kid and obviously growing up. I've had the privilege of seeing them at Wembley against the Minnesota Vikings, but I've never been to Pittsburgh to see them at Heinz Field yet. So that's something that I really want to do sometime in the future. That is uh, certainly on the bucket list. Well, actually, I was, I was uh, watching the first quarter of the Steelers-Browns game and it was just like watching my New York Jets, actually. <laughs> Very, very uh, oh, people, Don't go there. The people that didn't see that after the first quarter, the Steelers were down by 28 to nothing. 28 to nothing. They four touchdowns against them. That was uh, a bit Jets esque, let's say. Yeah, I, I remember sitting on the sofa and uh, I've got a brand new TJ Watt jersey on. Mm -hmm. And I've got this huge superstition. And anybody who follows me on, on Twitter will know this already because I tweeted about it. I have a, an old. Troy Polamalu jersey uh, with the number 43 on it and for some reason every time I wore this jersey we lost so I stopped wearing it I never wore a jersey for a game and I thought I've got to get over this so I got a new TJ Watt jersey and I thought I'm going to wear it for the first game of the playoffs and the first quarter I wear this jersey we are down 28 points I'm thinking this is no longer a superstition this is a curse so I take the jersey off throw it on the floor and Lo and behold, the rest of the game was better. So that jersey's been put in a drawer now, and I'll never wear it again. 
You should have thrown it away after the 14 nothing. Maybe, maybe you could. Have. <laughs> yeah, I am incredibly superstitious, and that it is one of my faults. But yeah, you know I'm, why? The, you know why the Polamalu jersey didn't work for you? Because you don't have the hair to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Yeah, he, he does well, have wonderful for, hair. For the people that don't know, you got it. Google Google pictures. Troy Polamalu. It's uh, that you will understand why why, why we laugh there. So, yeah. Gezi, we we've been thinking. I mean, uh, American football. The ball is the same shape as, as a rugby ball. Is it? Is there, uh, do you follow American football as well, or is that uh, is it too? No, soft? I, um, I, I have seen I've seen bits of it, but it's too much stop starting all the time. It's boring for me. Like it's a, it's a bit like rugby league, but you know, rugby league is is a bit more flow to it than than that um, American football. But yes, you pass one ball, get tackled, and you have a five minute rest. <laughs> well. <laughs> Actually, that, that's that's what I thought about American football a couple of years ago, and then and there came this dreadful night where we were all watching the Super Bowl and and we were having this Super Bowl party, and I was not interested in football whatsoever. And and this one guy who was very much into football, he brought six or seven NFL jerseys because he's got a collection, and I was the last last one to arrive at the party. So the only jersey that was left was number six in green and white of the New York Jets. Mark Sanchez, and then I got into football, and I thought, well, that's a sign. I got to follow the Jets now, and and it's been hell ever since. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the reason you um are not doing with the right team is that you wore a Sanchez jersey. I mean, that wasn't exactly a great sign. <laughs> <laughs> he did very well in his first two years. He was amazing, and and he went downhill very effing fast. Now let's 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 move on from this because actually we were, Paul and I we were talking about football early when we had our little little check here whether the technical stuff whether this all works and and Paul actually said that I guess you would make a fantastic running back in the NFL to just absolutely yeah I mean I watched a bit of footage of, of getting on on the rugby field and one of the skills that a running back has to have is to to palm off the people coming towards them they have that right and one thing that the Pittsburgh Steelers have not had all year, they've been statistically the worst running team of everybody in the NFL. And I did say it a couple of weeks ago after watching that footage during the World Championships. I thought, I'd stick Gezi Price in with Ben Roethlisberger any day because he knows <laughs> any of these teams. Stick a helmet on him and stick him in black and gold and I would have him on a, on a huge contract. But, you know, maybe sometime in the future. <laughs> And Paul Nicholson would have a new jersey to buy as well. Uh, I, I would protect Mr. Price by not buying the jersey. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, I see, I see, I see. So now we, 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 we spoke, spoke a lot now. So it's, I think it's about that time that we give one or two of our viewers another chance to ask one or two questions here. So why do we not go for Michael? There's a Michael here. And we're going Michael, to get... Michael, how <laughs> oh, imagine though, imagine though. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We're going to hear, obviously, whether it's Michael. Hey, guys. Hi, oh, that's obviously not Michael then, girl. We would have heard by, by the voice there. Hi, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a little bit higher than the Michael Van Gerwen voice. How are you guys? We're yeah, doing all right. And you, Michael, where, well. are you, where are you watching this from? Uh, near Munich, Bavaria. Well, look at that. It was the studio. Of under my bed, probably. I gotta check. Yeah, we're watching. We're watching. My lovely wife and I are watching uh, today, and um, we were wondering if um, Gervin is following a, a special diet, as he is uh, one of the more, let's say, athletic players in darts. Or is it allowed to have one or two beers after a big win like the World Championship? <clears throat> didn't um, Didn't you watch my interview uh, after the semis? I think, and I said I was gonna go and chill on kebabs and donuts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I try to eat, eat healthily, but obviously being on the road, and it's hard sometimes, but yeah, I try and take care of myself, but eating, eating healthy is one of my strengths. I, I can't okay. relate to that. I have no idea what you're talking about, girl, when this day. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, yeah, well, Michael. Thank you very much to you and your wife for watching us tonight. Have a lovely evening and take care. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. So I think we're gonna I think we're gonna have another one. Come on then. Um so we had two we had two fellas and we had one woman. So we're gonna make that two two and have Rafaela. Rafaela. 
who is watching us from South Europe now. Let's have a listen. Hello? Rafaela, there we go. Hi, Rafaela. Hi. Uh, Rafaela, where are you? Where are you? Uh, good English. Oh, das, das macht nichts, das macht nichts, dann übersetze ich das für dich. Erstmal, äh, schön, dass du, schön, dass du bei uns bist, schönen guten Abend. Von wo, von wo schaust du uns zu? Äh, gerade aus dem Auto, äh, weil ich gerade bei meiner Mama war. Aber ah, ich bin ah, so happy, dass ich da gerade dabei sein darf. Ich bin so happy, dass ich da gerade dabei sein darf. Ich bin so ein bisschen, ich habe das ne? Um, ja, wir, wir sind auch happy, dass du bei uns bist. Hast du eine Frage an Paul Nicholson oder Gerwin Price? Raffaella? Raffaella has left the building, apparently. That is, um, that is a shame. Hallo? Ah, oh, no. Raffaella, da bist, da bist du ja wieder. Raffaella, hast du eine Frage an, an Paul oder Gerwin? Ja, wie viel trainiert er, dass er äh, so einen Average geschafft hat? Ich meine, das hat noch keiner geschafft. Das, das war wirklich ein Traum bei, dem, bei der WM. Ja, also Frage an Gerwin Price, ja? Ja. Gerwin, the question is, how, how much do you, do you practice to play, to, to play as well as, as you obviously do and as, as well as you have been at the Worlds? Um, obviously, leading up to the Worlds, I put a bit more practice in, a bit more time on the board, but usually You know, when Premier League is on and the schedule is quite quite busy, I don't, I don't really practice. I um, just try and take over just uh, an hour or two a day, but lead up the Worlds, I practice a lot more, really. Also Rafael, normalerweise versucht er, dadurch, dass, dass der ja, Terminplan für die Dartspieler auch so eng gestrickt ist, gar nicht so viel zu trainieren und macht so ein oder zwei Stunden am Tag. Vor der WM hat er natürlich ein bisschen mehr trainiert, wie das die meisten Spieler machen. Ähm, aber ansonsten ist es so bei ein oder zwei Stunden am Tag. Da macht er gar nicht, macht er gar nicht so sehr viel. Okay. Wahnsinn, weil viele spielen ja acht Stunden am Tag äh, nur zum Trainieren. Das ist Wahnsinn. Das, die WM war wirklich ein Wahnsinn. Also, Congratulations, Gerwin Price. You have to compete, really. She says, "Congratulations again on your on your world championship, and you des you deserve it. You absolutely deserve it." She says. Rafaela, thank you very much. Vielen vielen Dank, dass du deine Frage gestellt hast. Danke, dass du aus dem Auto heraus sogar bei uns gewesen bist. Noch einen schönen Abend für dich und komm komm gut ans Ziel. Gerade Port angekommen. Danke, 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 danke. Super, mach's gut, Rafaela. Ciao. Danke, ciao. From the car, you know, this is this is how important the not so late night dance show has become. People are watching us from the car wherever they can. <laughs> Amazing. So, guys, uh, we've got another like 20 minutes to go here, and obviously, when I've got Paul Nicholson and, and Gerwin Prize as my guests, uh, when we, we asked we asked our viewers a couple of uh, a couple of whether they've got questions on on Instagram, they could send in their questions on Insta. And uh, what, what's been coming in quite regularly was uh, the term bad boy, the bad guy. You know, um, obviously you, 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 two, you two are players that, uh, you know, you've had your, your fair share of, of let's say, uh, in the incidents or runnings with, with, with the crowd. But I, I think the, the two of you is rather, it's, it's a bit different actually, because, uh, because Gerwin, I think you are just the way you are on stage. There's, there's no, 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 no acting or no show. With, with Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but I think there's, it was a bit of pantomime villain about it, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that's very accurate. You know, you look at the way that uh, Gerwin plays the game uh, from his first year on tour to how he's performed all the way through to his first World Championship. There is no difference, really. If There may have been an increase in intensity, but essentially it's the same thing. So with me, it was manufactured. It was uh, with a view to trying to entertain and trying to manufacture an alter ego just to make myself, you know, manufacture a little bit of extra confidence in very small amounts. But what you see with Gerwin Price is, is what you get. That's his brand. With me, away from the hockey, completely different to what I really <coughs> on stage. The amount of times that I met people in real life who said, when I first saw, uh, saw you play darts, I hated you. And then when they spend a bit of time with me, they say, well, you're actually not that bad. I said, well, this is the thing because... I manufactured this image not to, you know, get in the Premier League or anything like that. That's not the way it was. I just wanted to have the ability to play a role that I always wanted to play. 
even when I was a young county player for Northumberland, playing against other counties around the UK, I used to stick the sunglasses on and try different things. And I was trying to find something that worked. And it wasn't intentional for the bad boy thing. I just wanted to try and be cool. But ultimately, it went the way it was. And I'm not going to lie, it got me a lot of exhibitions. I, I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> So now, before before we ask Erwin, let, let's ask our viewers as well. I mean, there's obviously always a lot of discussion about about this, about players that show a lot of emotion, about the bad boys that try to to get the crowd going a little bit. What do our viewers say? Bad boys in Dars, entertaining or annoying, or maybe they're neutral to it. Let, let's see what they've got to say before we ask Erwin. Erwin, was that a rather a rather accurate assessment uh, when I tried to uh, differentiate between what Paul did and what, when, what, what you're doing with you? There's just no... This is the real deal, really. That's that's what you get. Yeah, exactly. Like Paul said, I, I've been the same player since day one. I mean, even before, I think everybody just looks at that Gary game. They always go back to 2018 Grand Slam final and they just look at that game and then that's what they build my image off. But if you go back even further than that, when I played, you know, um, Adrian Lewis in, in, in the match play in 2015, I think it was, and then Phil the year later... All my games are exactly the same. It's just, I think they've just got my image from that one game and they just won't let it go. I was, I was actually going to ask, you know, when uh, I, I didn't mention it when we were talking about the, the World Championships, but obviously all the media, they brought this, this Grand Slam final between you and Gary. They brought that back out again and brought it back up again. Was that actually, was that playing a role between the two of you still or was that just, just gone really? Or no, no big deal anymore? I don't think it was a deal in the beginning. It was just obviously built up and it's good for TV. It's good to have um, some rivalries in the game and it's good good to big up the games. They did the same with me and A.D. Lewis as well a couple of years previous to that. But you know, it was good to get people interested and get people watching. But I don't really take much notice of it. And I just go out there, try play darts. And that's all I've done from day one and that's what I'll keep doing. But yeah, it's good, it's good to to get some sort of rivalry going on the TV. But like I said, I don't try and, I try not to take any notice. You know, now let's take take a look here at what our viewers had to say. To say, I think Gerwin, you're actually on the very right track here. Is there a bit of Gerwin price bias going on here? I don't think so. It's 69% that say bad boys are actually very entertaining. Maybe they were afraid that you were going to shout at them, but uh, they didn't have that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> But I think uh, I would I would agree to that. I think it's what we all want to see, at least a little bit, you know, a bit of, uh, yeah, a bit of needle, a bit of a bit of emotion going on on stage. I think it's uh, you know makes makes the thing worthwhile, watchable, and uh, it's, it's great great to th great to see that actually. Coming coming back to you, Paul. Um, I mean, you explained how that sort of came about that that bad boy persona. Um, looking back at it and how everything went. Obviously, you won a major in two thousand and ten, but. Would you do would you do it the same way again, or would you try to sort of pl play normal, or not play normal, but just be yourself? I think I, I I wouldn't change a lot of things. There's certain games that I'd like to have back. I would approach um, the way I uh, was feeling in certain situations and the way I used my feelings a lot uh, more astutely. I think the the benefit of retrospect is that you can learn once you've done something. And you can't turn the clock back. But um, I think the, the things that I've been through with obviously World Cup final, uh, you know, some turbulent stuff at Blackpool, the place that I despise, because every time I went there, it was heartbreaking. I know that a lot of players really love it there, but I genuinely don't. But I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I should spend much time regretting things. There are things that I, I do wish I'd not done. Uh, like having a go at the crowd at the UK Open in 2010 wasn't the smartest move. I'm just glad that Russ Bray was there to hold me back. But when adrenaline takes hold, it, it's, it's quite incredible what it does to you. But what I will say is I remember the first time I played Gerwin Price and it was in Coventry at a European qualifier and he beat me convincingly. And I went back to my table and said, who was that? Who was that? I didn't have a clue who he was. And we had a few close games after that. And Gerwin's won every game apart from one, <laughs> quite convincingly. <laughs> but I genuinely enjoyed every single game we played because I think the way that I think about the game is it's about where it's going. 
where it is now and not where it's been. We've seen a lot of players over the last few seasons take exception to uh, certain celebrations and aggression on the hockey. And yes, I'm talking about Mervyn King, I'm talking about Gary Anderson and, and some others. But the fact of the matter is this sport is going in a different direction now. We have this spirit of the game, which was very accurate in previous years. But now we want people to celebrate. We want the sport to be more watchable. And if that's going to be the case, these older school players are just going to have to get used to it because more titles that Gerwin wins, the more titles that, say, Dirk van Dijvenborde wins, the more celebrations we're going to get, the more watchable it is. And they're just going to have to get used to it. I think we could we could see on on Twitter actually today that the game is already changing. If if you've not checked it out yet, go to to Devin Peterson's Twitter account and check out the little six year old South yeah. African lad who hit a bullseye and gave. I'm not even going to say gave a go and prize impression because I think that just comes naturally to a little lad. That was <laughs> go and you will be, have you seen it already? You you'll be proud. You'll be proud. Yeah, my my wife actually showed me ten minutes before we came on and. I, <laughs> Yeah, she showed me it there. He says a young kid from South Africa. And, yeah, he's, he's got he's got a lot to learn with the role, but he's getting there. <laughs> well, no one's perfect. Eh? No one, no one's perfect. Not not that young either. <laughs> not that young either. So, as we are approaching eight o'clock German time or seven p.m. English time, I think it's time for a couple of more of our viewers to have their to have their questions to have their say. We've all we've only had German guys. I'm going to go for an, for. An, English sounding name at least. Now we're going to go for Dylan. Dylan. Let's wait and see. And now it's Dylan from Cologne. <laughs> Hello. Hi there. Hi, Dylan. Oh, yeah. Um, Gerwin probably knows a little bit. I'm, I run the PDC Cymru account, Gaz. Oh, you're right. Are you right? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, just a quick question. Um, obviously, you've reached the, the top of the game now, the pinnacle being the world champion. Do you still see an area of your game that you can strengthen or improve on? Um, yeah, obviously, I'm, I'm still pretty new to this game. Obviously, only been in the PDC for seven years. I'm, I'm learning every time. You know, Even in this world championship, I don't think I reached half of what I'm, I'm capable of. Uh, I learned a lot in the Peter Peter Wright semi final last year, and you know that, that that sort of spurred me on this year and not wasting another opportunity, especially when I got to quarters and and semis. But yeah, I just need to scrape up and bring my game together a lot more. I, I can score well in patches, and then I'm missing doubles, or the other way around. I'm not quite on my game, but I have to take out a big check out like the Stephen Bundy and uh, the Stephen Bundy game. Yeah, I'm just gonna you know put a lot more practice in and hopefully bring that, that game all together and be a more complete player, maybe, you know, if it's not this year, but over the next two, three, four years, hopefully. Brilliant. And just maybe a question, maybe to all, all three of you then. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the, um, the fact is that Gerwin won his uh, um, tour card when Michael, um, Michael was world number one back in 2014. Who, who would the three of you see now as a, you know, somebody who's new on the scene as a future world number one, maybe in five, six years' time? Oh, that's a, well, Dylan, that's he, a difficult he, one. I, I would say he's, he's, he's probably coming from Q School this year, now, isn't he? So we don't know him yet. <laughs> <laughs> you see, it's, that's a clever answer. That, I like that. <laughs> well done. <laughs> that's, you, see, you see, these are the professionals. They know how to dodge a question. That is, that is good. <laughs> Well, Dylan, we're going to have a long, hard think about that. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. I mean, judging by the, by, the, by the accent, you're not joining us from Cologne. It sounded rather Welsh, didn't it? Yeah, I'm uh, just outside Cardiff in a place called Barry. Uh, if people know Barry. of Gavin, see. <laughs> that's, that's a rather short place name. We were expecting <laughs> 58 letters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can actually say that place, actually. You can say that? Yeah, Llanfair Pwlcyn Gell Go Gerach Wyn Drobwr, Llanfair Silio Go Go Go. Oh, oh, play, play. That's a world champion in itself, eh? <laughs> Man, the Welsh, the Welsh, jeez. So Welsh. <laughs> Dylan, Dylan, thank you so much. That, that, no, that was pro you probably provided us with the highlight of this show tonight. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for joining us. Have a lovely night. Take care, buddy. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity and congratulations, guys.
Cheers, bro. Thanks. No worries. Thank you. Now, here we go. I think we have time. We have time for one more. And this time we go for Stefan. Stefan is going to join us. He really pronounced it. He pulled that off. Can you believe it? It's like, <laughs> Stefan, can you pronounce that as well? No, it's probably, probably German. <laughs> uh, Stefan, you have to unmute yourself there. Can you hear me? Stefan, we can hear you. Stefan, where are you joining us from? Where are you watching from? I'm, I'm joining you with my 15 years old, old son next to me from Hamburg, Germany. From so Hamburg, hello. Again. So Darts is, uh, we've got a lot of fans growing here in Germany. Yeah, good, thanks. So congratulations. And uh, be because of my son next to me, he's, he's really crazy in darts and um, he wants to follow you as the PDC champion. What would you recommend him? Because as his father, he is he's, uh, not so involved in school things and learning, just playing the darts. So how, how old is he again? 15? Yes, he's 15. Yeah, well, obviously, um, I think Steve Brown and a couple of the other boys has got the JDC going. So I think it'd probably be in his interest to maybe join something like that over the next next couple of months or next couple of years and just get the experience. and. When he's old enough then to go and enter Q school, then give it a crack because anything's possible. But obviously, keep practicing, stay on the board, and yeah, maybe join the JDC. Yes, and you should also learn something for a, for a, for a usual job, not just only playing the darts. Yeah, you've, all, you've always got to have a backup, haven't you? But yeah, get, get the school, get, get the uni, maybe, I don't know, whatever, he's, whatever his interest yeah. is. But... So yeah, stick to school first and hopefully darts will come later on. Yeah. And uh, yeah. can I ask another question? If it's a short one, you can ask another yes, question. Uh, yeah. Gavin, when, when, do you remember a situation when you first thought uh, you, you got, a, you got a, um, a special skill of playing the darts? When did, is there a moment you recognized uh, you got uh, a, special, uh, a special skill more than, than others um, to, to learn well, it so I, fast? I didn't really believe that I would get to where I am now, but I think in 2015 when I played in the match play and I beat Eddie Lewis over, you know, a, a real recognized player over, over the distance that I did, I sort of thought, uh, sat back and thought, yeah, I, I can do this. I can play with the big boys. I, I can earn a living out, out of this and I am pretty good. And I think, yeah, that, that moment, 2015, I think it was a, a quarter final, I think, against Eddie Lewis. That was the time where I thought, yeah, the rugby's behind me now. I need to get on that practice board and, and give this a good crack. Okay. Thank you very much. No worries. Cheers, bud. Yes. Evan, thank you very much to you thank and your you. son for joining us tonight and, and tell him, finish school first. I think that's the yes, takeaway, yes, yes. <laughs> takeaway message from tonight. School first and then the darts, and I think uh, that's, that's the proper way to do it. Yes, we hope together. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan, fingers crossed. Take care. Thank you very much for take, joining. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. So now, as we are nearly out of time, I say that like, the final two little questions, they, they go to me or in, indirectly, let's say, because those were questions as well that were sent in via Instagram. One that we just found particularly funny that was directed at, at Gerwin. Gerwin, how much do you bench press? <laughs> Uh, I, I, don't, I wouldn't know now, but back in my day, uh, I don't know, I could probably bench press my body weight, which was 100 kilograms at the time, but you know, that was probably for, for six, seven or eight reps, but I don't know what my one rep max was back in the day. I was rubbish at bench press anyway. I was more of a squat. I had, I had some nice quads and I, I'd like to get, get a few weights on the rack and do some squatting, but yeah, my, my chest was pretty weak. You know, the squads are much better for your career as a running back as well. So, you know, we've got to keep that in mind. And there's, there's one question that came up quite frequently that was sort of, you know, handling the, the difficult side of the dance a little bit. How, how to deal with, with defeats, how to deal with the phases when, it, when it's not going well. <laughs> to Paul, this one. This time. Yeah, that's, that's a difficult one to answer. Uh, you know, throughout my career, it was one of the things that I really struggled with. I've always been a naturally competitive person and defeat was something I never really took well. And uh, as much as I 
tried to try and take the pressure off myself when I'd lost to anybody. Uh, it was just something I really struggled with. And it got to the stage where it was affecting my anxiety levels. And consequently, my form dipped because of constantly being defeated. And it was, it was making my skin even thinner. And I went through a, a process of meditation, just trying to be at ease with it. I think if I came back now, I would still have the same issues because I've got that competitive fire burning inside me. And that's what got me there in the first place. I think anybody who is trying to cope with defeat, uh, it's just one thing you have to, have to cope with. If, if you're a bad loser, it's because you're a very good winner. And we hear that a lot from, from different pundits and analysts and people within different sports, but that's just the, the human nature side of it. If you're a bad loser, you're usually a good winner. You see, we could actually end this, end this show on a Vince Lombardi quote to, to come back to the to American football once said, show me a good loser and I show you a loser. So that's a, probably, probably a lot of truth to that there. Absolutely right. So that concludes the second episode of the Not So Late Night Darts show. A big, big thank you, obviously, to our world champion to go in prize and Paul Nicholson for joining us tonight. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Always enjoyed it. And a big thank you to, every, to each and every one of you who's been, who's been watching this, who's been following this, who, uh, who asked questions. Uh, keep your eyes peeled on the uh, PDC Europe social media pages, Facebook, uh, Twitter and Instagram. We are trying to have at least at least uh, three or four, or, or, or well, let's say at least three episodes of the uh, Not So Late My Dad show every month. So keep your eyes peeled for episode three and, uh, and our guests then. I want to thank you all for joining us. Thanks a lot and uh, most important part uh, in this difficult time. Stay healthy, take care. Bye-bye. See you guys. Cheers. Bye-bye. Yeah.